After worship last week, uh, on the way out, somebody remarked to me how hopeless all those readings seemed. Uh, Ecclesiastes was verging on nihilism, you know, vanity of vanities, everything is vanity. Even the gospel reading from Luke ended with a warning. And that's because last week was only half the story. This week we get the second half. Now everything clicks into place. After telling the parable of the rich fool and warning his hearers, so it is with those who store up for themselves, uh, store up treasures for themselves, but are not rich before toward God. Jesus then turns to his disciples and continues, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, or about your body, what you will wear. He tells them to consider the ravens, who do not build barns like the rich fool, but still have plenty to eat somehow. Or the lilies, who do not labor or spin, but are clothed with more beauty than Solomon himself. God designed the world so that all living creatures would have enough. But of course, not all do. And that's because, he says, the nations strive and squabble over enough. We fight over what there is, we store it up and we hoard it instead of sharing it. And so that's why he says, while the nations strive for those things, we ought to strive for one thing only, God's kingdom, God's intention for the world as it should be, where everyone and everything has enough because it's shared instead of hoarded. Reading the story from last week is hard and awkward because it's wise and prudent to set aside something for the future. But that kind of prudence also can lead very easily to the foolishness of idolatry. Our fear of not having enough can convince us that enough, whatever that enough might be, will make us safe and happy and fulfilled. But as Jesus says, where our treasures are, there our hearts will be also. Treasure has a tendency of drawing our trust and ultimately even our worship. And so in contrast to the rich fool, Scripture offers the example of Abraham. Abraham, who in our story today still goes by the name Abram or Avram. Abraham is also a rich man, exceedingly rich, but he was no fool. When God came to him and called him to leave his homeland and his people, for some reason, that's what he did. When God told him that he would have descendants as numerous as the stars, in spite of the fact that he and his wife were both elderly and his wife was infertile, for some reason, he believed. We might, we might say that makes Abraham gullible or even foolish. But God said it makes him righteous. As I read his story, I get the sense that Abraham didn't do what God told him out of a sense of obedience. He wasn't following orders or obeying commandments. He was accepting an invitation. He accepted it because he believed that in spite of all evidence to the contrary, God was trustworthy, worthy of his trust. Righteousness isn't about obedience or piety. It simply means being in a relationship with God that is right or correct or true. Abraham knew, or at least guessed, who God is. And it turns out he was right. God was worthy of his trust. That's what the verse means when it says that his faith or his trust was reckoned to him as righteousness. It just means that he was right to trust in God. That, that his, his trust was not misplaced or abused. But it's worth remembering that Abraham is not the hero of this story because without God's trustworthiness, all of Abraham's trust would have been for nothing. The hero of the story is God, not Abraham. The letter to the Hebrews recounts how Abraham and Isaac and Jacob lived their entire lives in tents as foreigners in a land that God had, not, had promised, not to them, but to their ancestors or their uh, descendants. 
And they did that because they believed God's promise. They had faith in that promise, even though they had no proof, no guarantee. They trusted God, and God's trustworthiness delivered. The rich fool, on the other hand, trusted only himself and his own possessions and his treasures, things that ultimately were not worthy of his trust. He was not in right relationship with God. Abraham heard God speak and thought that God was telling the truth, even though he had no reason to believe so. The rich fool thought that God was lying. He lived in a way that called God a liar, a maker of promises that couldn't or wouldn't be kept. You see the difference? And that's why Jesus is so pointed here. That's what's at stake for him. It might make us mildly uncomfortable to sit here as mostly middle-class, privileged Americans and listen to him warn us about the dangers of wealth and privilege. But the reality is that those things can and often do damage our relationship with God and with one another and with the world by usurping our trust. Where our treasures are, where we have placed our treasures in our storehouses, and our bank accounts, and our storage units, there our hearts will be also. Jesus isn't scolding us here. He's warning us. Warning us to be careful that we don't lose faith in what's real by trusting in those treasures and worrying about those things that cannot extend our lives by a single second. But wealth doesn't need to be corrosive, does it? Abraham, as rich as he was, still trusted God. Why is that? When God told him to get up and start moving everything he owned to some undisclosed location, he could have said, you know what? No thanks, God. I got all I need right here. I'm happy where I am with my flocks and my servants and my family support system. But he didn't. He got up and he went. And because he got up and went, the entire Hebrew people came into being and became who they are. Because he got up and went, even Gentiles like us have come to know God who is trustworthy. So what is it that made Abraham get up and leave everything even though he lacked for nothing? Clearly, he didn't want or need more wealth. His trust must have been in something else, something God was doing. The preacher in the letter to the Hebrews says that he was seeking a homeland, not the homeland he came from, Ur of the Chaldeans, but a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Doesn't that sound familiar? Aren't we constantly looking for a better country, one free of all the problems that this one has? Isn't it that heavenly country that we hope to experience someday, maybe when we shuffle off this mortal coil? What Jesus asks us today is simply this. If we've got our treasure stored in this country, invested in this market, and based on this economy, then what incentive do we have to leave this country and strike out in hope for the heavenly one? Those who trust in God, as Abraham did, will never be rich. We may have all kinds of money and possessions and fame and glory, flocks and servants to rival Abraham himself, but we will always be living in tents as foreigners and refugees, waiting for the fulfillment of a promise yet to be received. We will always be waiting with our lamps lighted for the master who come of the house to return. That's what it means to hope, to live in the conviction of things which are unseen. So what does it look like to live in the tents of faith? We know what it looks like to invest in this world, to be like the rich fool, to build ourselves bigger barns so that we can eat, drink, and be merry. But what does it look like to invest in the impossible promise of God. 
What does that look like? What does it mean to live as foreigners and refugees, even if you own your own home, even if you've been in this community for generations? I think back to Abraham living in a tent in Canaan. I imagine him looking out across the barren lands and the tiny villages and seeing with his mind's eye the cities filled with his offspring who would one day live there. He was a foreigner with no clan, no relatives nearby. And yet I wonder if living in the reality of that promise, a promise, I'll remind you, that he himself would never receive, I wonder if living in the reality of that promise helped him to think of that strange land as home. In fact, I wonder if maybe that isn't what Jesus means when he urges us to watchfulness today. He tells another parable about slaves uh, whom the master, returning late, finds ready. And the master, he says, having just returned from this wedding banquet, probably tired, most likely drunk, then proceeds to sit the slaves down at the table and serve them dinner in the middle of the night. That's not how the story goes, is it? What an unexpected kindness. And because that's not how the story actually goes, it makes me wonder if Jesus is telling another story here. What if this story, rather than being a story about God rewarding those who stay ready, what if this story is actually instead a story about Abraham and those people like him? Maybe this is a story about how people who are mindful of the promises that God has made, people who live lives invested in those promises, might find that the master unexpectedly brings the wedding banquet home with him to them. Might this be a story about how living in the reality of a promise not yet received might actually help us to somehow unexpectedly receive that impossible promise? Maybe something like a son being born to an elderly barren couple? If the life of faith may be the life of faith may be lived in tents as strangers and refugees, but I wonder if in the course of that life there come moments where the canvas walls suddenly become stone, if only for a second. Do you get my meaning? I wonder if faith, if trusting in God's impossible promises actually allows us to experience those promises impossibly, even if only for a moment. If faith allows us to see what is unseen. I wonder if it might be those fleeting moments of seeing God's kingdom shining through the cracks in this one, or even just the hope of seeing those moments, or even just the hope that one day our children's 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 children will see those moments that allow us to do foolish, gullible, naive things, things like sharing what we have as though it were never ours to begin with, or showing kindness without reason, or welcoming a stranger into our home, or investing in an impossible dream to make the world a kinder, gentler place with no guarantee that it ever will be. As we look out through the flaps of our tents and imagine the streets of the city that God has prepared for us, might not that hope allow us even for brief moments, to live in that city, even though it's not here yet. I wonder if that's what faith is, to put our treasure, our time, and our energy, and our focus where we want our hearts to be, and to let those things draw our hearts closer to God, to live the way that we want the world to live, even if it doesn't make a lick of difference for anyone else out there. If we are foreigners and refugees here, it is because the home for which we wait has not yet come into being. We may never live there, but does that mean that we can never live as if 
it is here already? Might it not become just a tiny bit more real in that? <laughs> 